Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Week 5 preview show on Legendary Upside. I'm your host, Sam Sherman. Joined, as always, by Pat Crane. Pat, how are we doing? Doing good. How are you guys doing? I'm great. And also joined by Sack Religious. Sack, how's your Friday going? It's going well so far. Excited for another week. Uh, looking forward to breaking down the slate here. Yeah. And uh, we were just talking with Sack. He's going to give away all of the edges he's come up with all week in Battle Royale. He's going to completely uh, wipe those off the table with the insight he's going to give us today. So looking forward to that as well. All right, let's dive right in. We have we have four games that we're going to discuss, maybe uh, a fifth if we have time. We have Green Bay at the Rams. We have Baltimore at Cincinnati, Buffalo at Houston, and Carolina at Chicago. And then at the end, probably going to touch on Colts, Jags as well. So those are the five games we'll be breaking down, as always. To find even more insight on all these games, check out legendaryupside.com. Pat has a great breakdown in his walkthrough of all games on the main slate today i will say sorry guys um we can maybe edit this out but there's there's some background noise that i'm hearing you guys all right that? yeah we're, we're not gonna edit it out but uh yeah okay. i'll try to yeah okay got it that was just um coming through strong on my end so <laughs> not editing it out we'll, we'll keep going here let's start here with the packers at the rams jordan love looks pretty good last week in his first game back get the Rams team that's been struggling to stop anyone. Start with you here, Pat. How exciting is this matchup for Jordan Love? Because at first glance, it seems really exciting to me. Yeah, so I in the walkthrough, I, the way I do it is I have uh, the the cover boy, the, the title. That game is always above the paywall. And I try to make it a 1 o'clock game because it's just like a little cleaner, right? Like it's just like I start in order chronologically, we go down. This week we got a London game that I covered, so it was already going to be like a little weird. And I was like, I'm making this the cover boy. I'm making Dontavian Wicks the cover boy specifically. This game is really exciting, and it's just one that I had a lot more to say and a lot more excitement for than a lot of the other games in the early window. So if, if I'm breaking the rule uh, to not have the, the cover boy be from a 1 o'clock game, then I'm pretty excited about this 4 o'clock game. Love here, he gets a Rams defense that – is pressuring quarterbacks at the highest rate in the league. So that's not great, right? But if you dig into the numbers on the Rams, their their pass rush is consistent but extremely ineffective. They have the slowest time to pressure in the entire league at Mm 3.03 seconds. If you're getting pressure after three seconds, that's not necessarily doing it. Three seconds is a long time. If a quarterback has a time to throw of like 2.9 seconds, that's pretty long. A quick time to throw is like 2.4, 2.5 seconds. So you're giving the quarterback plenty of time before pressure even arrives. And it's creating a situation where the Rams are actually allowing a higher EPA per play on dropbacks when they get pressure than on dropbacks when they don't. Because you're looking at the potential for big plays, the quarterback being able to hold the ball for a long time. You're also looking at a defense that is allowing – 0.3 0.3 EPA per drop back per pressure drop back, which is really high. If you just look at like all defenses, that number would fall second worst. So the Rams, when they're getting pressure, are the second worst defense in the league. And again, they're worse than they than they normally are. They're one of two defenses in the entire league who's allowing positive EPA per play when they get pressure, the other being Jacksonville. But Jacksonville's only at 0.07. And again, the Rams are at 0.3. So this is not a difficult matchup for uh, for the Packers, despite you know this this pass rush that's that's going to get pressure. The Rams are 31st in EPL per dropback, 29th in dropback mm-hmm. success rate. They're allowing explosive plays. They're allowing explosive plays to the deep middle of the field. Um, it's just a really really strong matchup for the Packers passing offense. The Rams also don't blitz. Love has been blitzed a fair amount. Um, and when they do blitz, they're terrible. The 31st in EPA per blitz drop back. So I, I think that we're looking at the Packers offense that is going to be quite efficient. You're looking at Jordan Love as an aggressive passer, as we you know expected him to be based on last year. But uh, he's got a deep pass rate of 16%, which is very high. He's averaging one yard past the sticks on his average throw, which is pretty high. A lot mm. of quarterbacks throw short of the sticks on their average throw. 
It's got a 10.2 ADOT, very high, 7.2 average depth of completion, very high. 14% of his throws going to the splash zone, 10 plus yards downfield and over the middle of the field. That's very high. So it's like aggressive passer, lots of time to throw, very vulnerable defense. The only problem with the Packers is that we never know where the targets are going to go, but we actually know where they're going to go because Christian Watson is going to miss this game and Romeo Dobbs might miss this game. And Tucker Craft is coming off an elite route participation of 86% last week. So we've got, we can count on tight end routes from Kraft and then we can count on Jaden Reed and Dontavian Wicks to be very likely the guys who are making big plays this week. Dontavian Wicks has been awesome. He just hasn't run that many routes, but even like his first three target rate of 19% is 83rd percentile. So they're involving him in the game plan when he's out there. He just isn't always out there this week. He, he will be out there a lot more. That's why yeah. I'm so excited about him in particular, but Reed, obviously a fantastic play. Craft a really strong play. Um, it's just this this offense sets up very very nicely for the Packers passing game. Yeah, I I fully agree, and it's it's night and day compared to the matchup last week versus the Vikings. Obviously, the Packers were forced to throw a ton because they were blown out early in that game. So Love still got there statistically, but I expect him to be much more efficient in this game. We do in our preliminary early rankings on. Legendary upside. We have Jordan Love as a top five quarterback this week. So if you're deciding between him and, say, Justin Fields or Dak Prescott or Patrick Mahomes, I don't know how many people have that type of decision, but I, I do think Jordan Love is pretty much a must start this week unless you have one of the elite dual threat guys on your roster as well. Yeah. Like, why do you have them if you're not, like, you know, like you shouldn't be carrying yeah. two quarterbacks or trade one of them or something? But yeah. Get him in the lineup this week for sure. Exactly. Yeah. And um, yeah, moving to you here, Zach, Pat touched on this, but let's assume, um, I, I guess we're assuming Dobbs is out for now. Uh, it, it's He's been missing practice for, for personal reasons. So yeah, what do we expect in the wide receiver rotation with Christian Watson and, and maybe Dobbs out? How excited are you about Wicks and Reed? And then can we, is there any hope for like a Bo Melton sneaky start this week if Dobbs is out. Um, curious, if you have any thoughts there? Yeah, I I think that if you run into a situation where Wicks is going to be because the Wicks team is getting crazy right now. Like every every one I listen to is talking about how good a play Dontavian Wicks is. So it seems like that's getting out of hand. Uh, ownership already projects pretty high and similar to to what it does for Jaden Reed for Dontavian Wicks. So. I think I would say that, I mean, in a vacuum, like I just prefer Reed straight up because I think he's the better player. I think Dontavian Wicks is good, um, but I just think that it's it's no state secret that he's good. Like I think a lot of people, you know, really want to jam Dontavian Wicks this week. I, I was into Dobbs before he missed his third practice in a row for personal reasons. I think if he plays, he's still on the menu just because he'll probably go really low owned. And I don't know that he necessarily needs to practice for a full week. The The downside is, like, you know that they, the game plan is not being built around Romeo Dobbs if he plays. You know, he just missed practice for the entire week. So it's really just like, a, hey, there's variance in this game. Like, this could be the guy that scores the touchdown. So that's, that's kind of how I would play it around Dobbs. Um, I definitely think Bo Melton is really interesting if Dobbs is out, just because I don't know how many people will get there. He's particularly interesting for uh, over on Underdog, like the Battle Royale format, just because people won't have been drafting Bo Melton earlier this week. Um, so that you can't like the ownership can't fix itself. You know, when Dobbs is ruled out, not all of those will one to one swap to Bo Melton. Uh, so he's definitely interesting. Uh, and Tucker Craft's uh, role is extremely safe because must I mean he he already had beat out Musgrave, but if there was any kind of variance there and that, oh, maybe they, they view these guys as closer than we've seen them utilize so far this season, that's not going to come to fruition this week because Musgrave is injured. So even if he's active, I, I would expect it to be craft. Uh, so I like all these Packers pass catchers. I would just say if you're going to be stacking them up, uh, I think you could probably get a little sneaky and, and play Reed more as the one-off uh, because he can get there on the ground as well. And I think this is just going to be a really chalky game. So maybe that's one way where you can still get exposure to the game, but do it slightly differently than other people. That 
Makes sense. And yeah, I did think like Dobbs set up for set up to be a pretty good play if he was going to come in at really low ownership. But I agree with Zach. If he's been even if he plays this week, it's really tough to trust him having been out in practice all week. I will say this. This is an interesting note um, from Mike Leone, our friend over at Establish a Run. Since 2023, these are the target per outrun rates with Watt, Christian Watson off the field. It's Dobbs at 25% targets per outrun on 340-ish routes and Wicks at 23% targets per outrun. So I, I do think that Wicks is the better player. He's the more versatile player. He's the better yards after catch weapon for sure. I do think like the public perception of him being like clearly much better than Dobbs I'm I'm not quite fully in agreement, but maybe maybe that's more of a week six, week seven take because this personal stuff um, almost kind of puts Dobbs off the table for me this week. Let's yeah, Dobbs. It's tough to get excited about Dobbs because he is. It's just like he has been good at convincing the coaches ahead of the game to get him out on the field, right? But like once on the field which he's on there all the time. He's a 91% route participation this, this year, but he just doesn't do a ton. But, you know, if he goes, I do think he's a pretty strong play because you're, you're trying to find ways into this game environment that not everyone is going to go. And he just is not as exciting. He just, you know, he just is not nearly as exciting as Wicks. We, we've all been wanting Wicks to get more opportunity. He's going to get opportunity in a great matchup. That is just inherently going to drive people toward him. And then Reed has been incredibly efficient with actually yeah. not that much target volume. So if he's going to get more target volume, it's like very easy to imagine what the upside looks like there. But, you know, Dobbs could catch two touchdowns. He could have like 1.7 yards per out run and two touchdowns. You know, we, you don't have to have blow up as far as like, he doesn't have to be a, a playmaker. He just has to like be the guy who scores. So I would definitely keep him in mind if he, if he goes, especially if it's like, oh, that's no big deal. He's yeah. he expected to have a full role. That's something certainly to, to monitor the reporting on. Let's move on to the Rams side of things here. The storyline for the Rams passing game in week four was the emergence of Jordan Whittington. After playing pretty much just bit roles in weeks one through three, he emerged as a full-time player in week four, had a 30% target share. People were comparing his route tree to uh, the Puka Nakua role. Pat, how, how much can we buy into this emergence of Jordan Whittington, at least for this week? We know Puka and Cup should be back eventually, but... For this week, how excited can we be about Jordan Whittington? Yeah, I mean, I think we should be uh, both understanding that he is a fragile play, right? He wasn't really getting much work before a couple weeks ago. They threw him out there. Um, it went okay, you know. Um, I guess it went pretty well, you, you would say. He, he got a lot of targets, and he, he hasn't been bad. He's got 2.07 yards per hour on. So they're looking for people who can step up um, and help fill the role that Puka and Cup left behind. And Robinson has been pretty bad this year. Um, and they talked up Whittington a lot in the preseason. So shocker that Marcus Robinson has been bad, by the way. There's I know. Yeah. Who could have seen this coming? coming? Yeah. But um, I'm, I'm pretty like cautiously optimistic, I guess I would say on, on Whittington 97% route participation against the bears. is like a big deal for a rookie to get that level. And then to yeah. get all the targets, like, um, you know, his, his charts per hour of 24% is pretty good. He's also got a 4.5 a dot, which is not something I would normally be psyched about, but if like, if we're thinking like, what is the play here? And I think in some ways the play is like, this dude is going to rack up catches in a game environment where potentially the Rams are trailing. And you're kind of looking at like Matthew Stafford's Wandale Robinson, maybe. And that, yeah. that, could, that could work. That, I think that could actually work with the target vacuum here. That, that could definitely work. Yeah, I could definitely see him PPR scamming his way to nine catches for 62 yards uh, and getting there, given, given how cheap he is. Or if you can pick Sounds him up great. on waivers, uh, I think that's, that's totally fine. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's, it's him and Tutu, right? I think the problem with the Demarcus Robinson thesis is that he's a good dirty work receiver. He never to me was a receiver that had huge contingent upside. If something was to happen right. to one of the top two weapons, he's out there to like be good in the run blocking game to be good at like setting picks, blocking on screens. Like and he's, he's great at that stuff. And catch, catching the uncovered, ball. 
Yeah. Be uncovered in the red zone because they're worried about Cup and Puka. Yeah. That's great. He's, great role for Robinson. He's in the right place at the right time, reliable veteran, but it's 2-2. Yeah. It's pretty clearly 2-2 and Whittington that are the focal points of the passing game. I'd say, like, gun to my head, I had to start 2-2 or Jordan Whittington in some desperation flex spot in a league. I'm going 2-2 just because he's proven it. Um, he, he proved it last year when – Cup was out to start the season that he could be pretty good. He's proven it over the past two weeks that he can be solid. So, but yeah, I think I think they're very very yeah, close. I think I would okay. go Whittington. In it, it would depend. I think in DFS I'd probably go two two because I think people will go to Whittington. And he feels comfy, but that comfiness is why I probably just throw him in the flex. I'm like, you're gonna get if he had like two targets for ten yards, I'd be like, whoa. Whereas with two two, it wouldn't surprise me at all. You know, so yeah. I think for a flex spot. I probably am just like, I think I can get like 12 points out of this and that feels fine. So um, I get it. a little bit yeah. more bust, I think. 2-2's just been like, take all the games where Cup hasn't played and 2-2's been like remarkably consistent, like going back to last year, going back to even like the yeah. game where, where Cup got hurt in week two this year, like he immediately starts getting targets at a crazy high rate. So that's my case for 2-2 is like, that's he's, true. he's in a weird way, like, what the offense goes to when cup is missing for whatever reason it's not like a stylistic thing um it's maybe just like he's the one guy on the field with speed thing but anyways yep. don't i think the whittington call i i wouldn't push back again it's it's flipping close to flipping a coin for me let's let's move on uh sack to the running side of the game here for the rams people have been pointing out on twitter i know pat uh, pointed this out in his walkthrough as well Kyron williams if you look at the advanced rushing stuff looks like one of the worst running backs in the league. Like, should we be worried about this at all moving forward? Or is the volume just like too big to fail for Kyron Williams? Yeah. If you're in a points per advanced metrics league, you got to keep Kyron on the bench this week, but in any other format, nope, <laughs> not, not concerned mm -hmm. at all. Cause he is getting the Christian McCaffrey workload. So it like, this guy could run backwards on half of his plays. He's, he's getting the Jordan Mason workload is really what it is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He'd still be. They don't, they don't throw to him that much. Yeah. Yeah, he's less less involved in the passing game this year than he was last year, actually, which is a little weird to me given their complete lack of receiving options. Yeah, but, I know. So, yeah, I, I wonder if that's just like a blip on the radar or if last year they kind of realized, like, eh, maybe we want to do different stuff in the passing game than getting it to you. So, but they. Uh, uh, I feel like McVeigh been... and Stafford. Sorry, sorry about it. I feel like McVeigh and Stafford are maybe just like too smart than to like make a running back a focal point of the passing game. I don't know. Throw, throwing that out there, like, but they, they don't do that a lot. But they, McVeigh had been lot. into the running back screen game stuff like pretty, that's pretty yeah. consistently historically. So, but you, if you have Todd Gurley, that's a little different. Right. It is. It is Williams. different. Like, yeah, yeah. Can you get can you generate an explosive? You're not going to yeah. generate an explosive with Kyron Williams, really that much at all. <laughs> but it, you know. The, the running back screens just are a little less enticing, I think. Yeah, no, that that certainly makes sense. I, uh, I I'm definitely into playing Kyron this week. He's probably the my second or third favorite running back on the slate. Um, I think one of the things that I'm thinking through with this game is that if it's not close, then Kyron's not going to have very many points, right? Because Kyron is the way that the Rams score touchdowns now. And so if the game's close, the odds that Kyron is putting up a, a usable to good fantasy week are going to be is pretty high. And so I think if you're playing Kyron, that's actually the route that I want to go if I'm going to play Jordan Love. Because Love is kind of like in the draft formats, especially Love's pretty expensive. Like he'll go before Jaden Daniels sometimes, which doesn't seem super good to me. So if you are going to play Love in underdog where you're, you know, having to pick between him and Jaden Daniels or him and Lamar Jackson or Josh Allen, the only time I really want to do that then is not because I have Jaden Reed because you could easily see a game get out of hand and Jaden Reed gets there, but it's really hard for Love to get there then if the game gets out of hand. So I prefer to play it through. I start with Kyron, then I go with Love, and then I just bring it back with Dontavion Wicks, and that's my pass catcher that I'm using with love uh, or worst case scenario, if I can't get Wicks, I'm, I'm scrolling way down for Bo Melton or I'm doing Tucker craft or something. Right. So that's kind of how I view Kyron is he is the, the linchpin to, Hey, this game remains close. Um, and if you're saying that the game doesn't remain close, then I think if you're going without Jordan love on a, a Packers pass catcher, 
then using one of the Rams receivers like Tutu uh, or Whittington makes a lot of sense to me. Got it. That makes sense. Pat, any any comments on the the Kyron stuff? I know you wrote that, about that in the walkthrough. Do you feel similarly uh, to Sack? Not not a big issue that he's been so inefficient. I do. I mean, I think especially you know you think about Kyron, what's really driving his value. Um, I think that the the easiest way to see it in the numbers is that this is a guy who's running back 49 in rush yards over expected per game, running back 38 in rush yards over expected per attempt, running back 40 in success rate. Uh, he does not have a breakaway run yet. Um, his elusive that rating seems is – It seems bad. His elusive rating is 24. <laughs> That's RB50. Uh, he's got 0 0.71 yards per route run, which is really bad. That's RB42. Fantasy he at least has really expected. fast. Uh, he's really fast time speed in the combine, though, right? So no, he's like super speed. slow, um, oh, unathletic. But if you look at okay, so all of those numbers horrendous. Fantasy points <laughs> over expected. He's dead. He's dead even minus point one. Yeah. So touchdowns. he's he's delivering on fantasy points on his workload, and it's it's touchdowns. The dude yeah. is scoring the touchdowns. He's getting the touchdowns. Uh, getting the touchdown opportunities. He's RB2 with 20.5 expected points per game. Now, that could definitely dry up, but I think logically, like, it dries up if the Rams don't get into the green zone because they don't have any receivers. <laughs> like, all the receivers are hurt. So I think it's like, it just makes sense. They, they, and we saw this last year that Kyron was just vacuuming up touchdowns and they were just running the ball a lot once they got in close. And he's been really good for them at the goal line. So I think we see that again. Um, you're betting on the Rams to be competitive and him to kind of soak up the touchdowns. That's that's kind of his thing. It's it's more fragile than like for as high as we're going to have Kyron ranked and everyone's going to have him ranked. It's more fragile, you know, than it. I think you could you could definitely fade him, but you know, season yeah. long and is he a good DFS play? Like yeah, I mean he's he's yeah. a a good bet to to turn in um, more more work in the red zone. Yeah, I think it's a silly thing to to worry about like on a weekly basis. Like you could make a case to me if you can get a ton of value for selling Kyron Williams in a trade, like sell him for Ken Walker plus or sell him for Devon A. Chain plus. Like if those types of offers were on the table, I'm not sure if they are. I would consider that because I do think it's fragile in the sense that I maybe, think maybe you could get A. Chain plus. Yeah. People are starting to get worried on A. Chain. Yeah. So something like that is appealing to me just in like – I don't know. Like, I, I don't even really want to say this in a podcast. Like, maybe Blake Corum will get more involved. But I, that seems <laughs> that seems like a terrible, <laughs> terrible thing to say, given how things have run out so far. Yeah. So it's not something I really believe. But just, just throwing it out there that the, the fragility, I think, with Kyron is a little bit higher than with someone, some of the other For top sure. backs. For Let's sure. move if, on if here. Anything, to... I think it'd be Ronnie Rivers, because that's who they've been. Chlorum hasn't even been getting snaps, but they have been using a little bit of Ronnie Rivers. It, and that's not really like he'd be useful. It's just like that would make Kyron less useful. I could see I could see it if Kyron missed time though, that Corum would for sure kind of be the them. one for one yeah. replacement. Yeah. Yeah. That's but I think I that's was. the problem for if you're not invested in Kyron, the problem is that like Corum seems like he literally is just a backup Kyron that they're that they're gonna like unseal from the package and put in the game, but only if Kyron misses time. <laughs> Yeah. Remember when they, they held Blake Corm out for all the preseason games, resting with the starters out? That was uh, yeah. certainly cool. Yeah. Um, let's a lot let's of talk there. now. Yeah, a lot of signal there. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. Uh, Ravens at Bengals. Moving on to this game. I think the story on the Ravens side of the ball, obviously Derrick Henry, number one story. I think number two story, Pat, is the Ravens pass catchers have been pretty atrocious in fantasy. Mark Andrews is the headline, but say Flowers has also been wildly frustrating. Are there, are there like any of these guys, any of the pass catchers that like are starters in regular 12 team fantasy football leagues? Like, are you still starting Zay Flowers? Are you looking at Isaiah likely? Can we trust any of these guys? The problem with likely is that he sort of flipped Andrews, but I say sort of because his route participation has not been very good. He was at 69% week one, 49% week two, which is, you know, true part-time like you know like Noah Fant 2023 kind of stuff 59 percent a similar range and then 62 percent uh last week so we want our tight ends if they're getting like peppered with targets like Kasicki's running like half the routes and he's get, he 
with Higgins out was getting peppered with targets and that we could like maybe use, but you know, Higgins comes back and then immediately dries up. It's just a very fragile thing to have a, a tight end who's not in a full-time role and likely is not. Andrews is in like a true part-time role. His snaps are, you know, completely drying up 33% of snaps in week, th- in week three and 46% of snaps in week four. The whole thing about him blocking more like, yeah, he's blocking more, but he's mostly just sitting on the bench. Um, but he need like, we need likely to complete the takeover, I think, before we're excited about him. He's kind of like a low end tight end one. Um, Andrews, I'm not interested in uh, until he, or, until an, or unless he regains playing time. Flowers, though, I do think I am interested in playing this week. It's scary. Um, but if you look at like what the Ravens offense is doing, they're not getting a ton, like the, the, their first three targets are pretty low. And you're also seeing stuff like Justice Hill is getting a lot of targets, right? Well, half of his targets have been checkdowns. And so you're like, this off, like when you're checking down, like something, the, the primary design of the play didn't succeed. And you look at Zay Flowers, he has a 20% targets per route run, which is okay. He has just an 8% first read target rate. So the I'm, I'm thinking that a fair amount of targets that are kind of supposed to go to Flowers or could have gone to Flowers are not. And if the offense starts clicking a little bit downfield, he would be the guy that would really benefit. He does have strong route participation, 94%. He actually has a 90th percentile open score. So it's prob- I don't, it doesn't even necessarily look that related to him. I think if in a, in a matchup where the offense starts clicking, we could see Flowers spike. Like this, this is the one dude um, that I actually do have some real optimism for going forward in this passing game. And then the Bengals, they're 25th in dropback success rate against. They're 25th in EPL out for dropback. They're preventing explosive plays pretty well, but this is not like a super strong passing matchup. And we know with Lamar, like he can just kind of get there in a big way uh, when it's all working for him in, you know, in one week. So I, I'm sticking with Flowers. Uh, the rest of it is you know, pretty thin. Yeah, that, that makes sense to me. Let's move over to the rushing uh, side of like the ball here. Zach, um, I have this in my show notes. How excited can we be about Derrick Henry versus Cincinnati defense? That was quote exposed by Jerry, Jeremy McNichols. Uh, Well, I think a big part of the Jeremy McNichols and Brian Robinson success from last week was that they play with such a dynamic rushing quarterback and Cincinnati defense was really stretched to try and account for both the running back and the quarterback keeping it. So it shouldn't be a problem this, oh, wait, shit, they have to deal with Lamar too. <laughs> no, yeah, so it's a, it's a fantastic well, Nichols spot. is way better than Derrick Henry though. That's what we also have to do. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's so a fantastic Watch the tape, man. For Jerry, watch the tape. It's yeah, pretty yeah. good. <laughs> The year yeah, running backwards out. into the end zone. I mean, come on. Yeah. That's, that's <laughs> I definitely drafted Jerry Mc, Jeremy McNichols on some like dynasty team in like 2017, and he was oh, drafted yeah. in the fifth drafted in the fifth round of the NFL draft, and then cut by his team before the start of the season. So I was uh, like, I don't know, man. This dude might be better than Dalvin Cook, to be honest. And you know what? <laughs> he eventually might, was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he eventually <laughs> was. Never yeah. wrong, just early. Yeah, I, I remember. Yeah. I don't know if you guys remember this when Jeremy McNichols was a rookie. I I want to say he was on Hard Knocks as a rookie. I might be misremembering. Yeah, I think that's right. I think you're right. I think you're right. And yeah. he he had a he had a phone call with Snoop Dogg, who is his. I, I think I don't think he's just blood uncle, but I believe he is his uncle. I don't mean blood as in gang. But I mean like blood. blood you understand related. what a blood uncle is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll we'll, but, we'll edit this part out. Don't worry. So but, <laughs> we also aren't editing this out. <laughs> Back to Derrick Henry. I think it's a pretty good spot. He is one of the top three running back plays on the slate. It's it's basically, you know, Jordan Mason, Kyron Williams, Derrick Henry, pick your poison. I think all three have pretty incredible roles. All three are less utilized in the passing game than some of the other, like, higher end running back options on the slate. We'll talk about later. But their workload is, is very strong. Um, they're all set up with pretty good matchups. So, yeah, I I think Henry is definitely in the mix. Um, It's kind of a fade the big dog at your own risk kind of spot. 
Yeah, yeah it, do, it, I mean, it does seem to me that the, I should say quickly, it seems like the Baltimore O-line, it could have been just um, the Bills defense last week. I'm not entirely sure on that, but the Baltimore O-line after really struggling the first couple of weeks does seem to be coming together. And that's something that's been like a consistent trend for Harbaugh coach teams that even with out a ton of talent in the O-line, they seem to figure it out. But sorry, sorry, Pat, what were you going to say? No, that's a great point. They're, and they're third in PFF's run block grades, seventh in run block win rate per ESPN. So, yeah, the, the blocking does look pretty good. The commitment to the run also looks really good. This is a team that has actually not been in positive game script a ton this year. Um, and yet they're running the ball a lot. So they're, they're one of these teams. I've got a chart in the walkthrough I always share that breaks teams into, into four groups. And they're one of the teams that is not dictating the run because the, the game script hasn't been positive enough. But they're essentially refusing to pass because they're in game scripts that are, you know, you would expect them to be tilted to the pass and they aren't. So this is a spot, I think, where even if, you know, it's a it's kind of a shootout or back and forth game where they're, they're trailing by like a touchdown for most of the game, they're still going to look to establish Derrick Henry here. And that's that's why I do think if you're fading him, it's a little it's a little tricky because I don't they're not they're going to really fight against being made one dimensional. And they're, they're going to really try to keep Henry involved. Mm -hmm. Let's move on to the Bengals side of the ball here. I wrote about this this week a little bit. The Chase Brown breakout was a storyline for the Bengals in their backfield last week. He got a couple goal line carries, looks shot out of cannon, running the ball. Curious your take, Pat. What What is the state of the Bengals backfield? So Moss was down to 60% of snaps last week from a high of 80% uh, in week two. He was at 77% in week three, but he was at 65% in week one. Um, this isn't necessarily like a changing of the guard situation. Chase Brown was at a season high 40% last week. I do think that Moss probably continues to lead, but like Chase Brown looks really good. And if this were to go to 50-50, you want Brown. Um, but... Yeah, I, the way these things tend to go, just from experience of doing this, it's like, we want this flip to happen now, but it probably happens in like week nine, right? Like, the, you know, just the way teams are. So mm -hmm. I would assume that Chase Brown is behind Moss again, but it sort of starts to go in his favor a little bit more. Maybe he's at 45% of snaps this week. He's already in the, the mix where I think you can put him in. I put him in in a dynasty league where I, you know, I'm pretty struggling for, for RB2 production. I had him in last week. So you, yeah. I think you can already justify starting him, but I would just expect it. It's almost like Bucky Irving. Like we, you know, we were excited about Bucky Irving last night, knowing he wouldn't get the majority of snaps, but just that he would be productive in what he did get. I think you're kind of looking at that type of play, kind of a better version of like throwing Braylon Allen out, out there. You know, that yeah, of. that makes sense. Yeah, I, I benched Chase Brown for Cam Akers last week. So uh, make sure to follow me at Sherman <laughs> underscore FFB for lots of good fantasy <laughs> football advice. I uh, won't make that the same mistake again. Cam, Cam Akers fooled me once. Uh, shame fool on me, fool twice. me twice. He's already fooled us twice. Hasn't he? he might. Honestly, yeah. he might. He might get me one more time this week. We'll talk about that <laughs> Yeah, later, yeah I think but, he's going to get me too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My, my takeaway on Chase Brown, I, I agree. Like you watch him and Zach Moss play and they look like they're playing at completely different speeds like chase brown's speed is legit we've known that last year he was one of the fastest ball carriers um in the nfl last year and miles per hour i think you have two problems with chase brown i think one and the, the biggest problem here is the pass protection stuff he simply you know he can get better at this it's not impossible for nmx to get better at this but he has not been trusted in one-on-one -on -one pass mm -hmm. protection situations at all. And when he has been trusted, he's been graded as one of the worst running backs in the league at it. So this year, watch all the snaps. Uh, PFF charted him with, with two pass protection snaps. I was only able to find one, and he lets a guy just completely blow by him, almost lets Joe Burrow get lit up. So, so that's the issue. Like, when you have Joe Burrow and you have Jamar Chase and T. Higgins, you, you don't want – the whole thing to get messed up by Chase Brown blowing a pass protection snap. So again, I think that just puts a cap on his snap share, at least in the near term. It doesn't mean he can't get there. An explosive player on 10, 12, 14 touches a game in the right game script that can still 
be very good. So, so I'm certainly not trying to bury him. I think he's an exciting player, but yeah, I'm skeptical. It sounded like you are too, Pat. I'm pretty skeptical. This is going to be like a full flip of Zach oh, Moss in the short term. Like, yeah. Yeah. And, and yep. you know, to the point that you're making about the pass protection, he is uh, at 23% route participation. Moss is at 58%. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's where, you know, you would expect Brown to be involved in the receiving game. But for the Bengals, like, they've got Burrow, Higgins, and Chase. And it's like, don't screw that up. You know, that that's exactly. the more important thing is to protect the quarterback there. Now, I, I know you're doing a lot more film analysis. And you know how they do the um, the 40 times where they'll actually overlay the players? Do you think okay. you're at the level now where you could overlay Rashad White <laughs> with Chase Brown and just see the <laughs> the quickness to the hole? Because I think there might be the biggest disparity between those yeah. two players. So, man, Rashad White's still thinking about actually running, but Chase Brown is seven yards upfield. We need some investigative journalism into Rashad White's time speed at the combine because I have not I have not seen that time speed once on an NFL. I season. saw it once uh, last night. He, he got up to speed, but he just doesn't. Yeah, it's a decision make. He doesn't. It's, yeah, even, it's indecisiveness. It's like he's like he's not running yet. He walks. I've never seen a running back walk before, but he he walks. Yeah. And then eventually he decides to hit the hole, but it's too late. They they are already tackling. Well, I've, I've like seen one running, running back walk before uh but it was levy on bell and he accelerated really really yeah. well after he diagnosed the hole and he also could diagnose the hole and rashad white cannot so it's it's jets it's jets levy on is what it reminds me of it's, yeah yeah it's, it's, oh, it's tough to God. watch <laughs> i will i will say with chase brown like what uh, another like to get on the positive side his yards before contact ability i think is really impressive now he doesn't always have the best vision. Like there's definitely times where you can find like, okay, why did you bounce that run outside? It's hard clearly. when you're moving that fast. How could you even yeah. see? Exactly. You know? Yeah. He, he's, he's running with a chick, like it's a chick all with a his head cut off, but there are times where like there's D tackles that you think can get him in the backfield. And he like, he swerves around a bunch of dudes before he can uh -huh. even get touched. So that, that is like a cool trade. It's not going to show up in like the, he's never going to be a missed tackles force guy because like when someone touches him, He's going down, but sometimes they don't even get to touch him because he's that fast. So um, that yeah. that's an exciting part of the Chase Brown profile. Let's move on here, Sack. I wanted to talk about Joe Burrow. I think a lot was made of his slow start, a lot of uh, wrist injury, trutherism. Can we put that slow start behind us now? He's looked pretty good the past couple weeks. And specifically, how excited can we be about Joe Burrow and the Bengals passing attack in this matchup versus Baltimore this week? Yeah, I, I think we can definitely put that behind us. We we talked about this on stat chasing, and even in week two, Dricko called out that he he thought that Burrow was a really good positive regression candidate, um, attributed a lot of the lack of success and efficiency to just not having his weapons, um, which makes sense. You know, you take away the best two receivers for a quarterback, and they struggle. It's almost like those things are connected. And so all of a sudden, he gets... Gets T. Higgins back. They pepper T. Higgins with targets. Jamar Chase does Jamar Chase, thing, Chase things. And Joe Burrow starts looking good. At the same time, you start to see targets for Mike Gesicki decrease. And the offense begins looking better. And, you know, they're not having to rely on Andre Yoshivas to make plays, which he seems only capable of doing in the red zone. Anywhere else on the field, he's allergic to catching the ball. In the red zone, he's, he's perfectly competent. So... I think a big part of it was just not having the weapons that he needed. And this game sets up to be a really good spot. It's a pretty high total. Um, the, the Bengals are not afraid of passing, too. Like, Joe Burrow will go out there and you know, get a bunch of attempts. I, I think, really, the, the only thing you're worried about here for Joe Burrow not having a good game is if the Bengals somehow get out to a really strong lead and then they're able to run the ball um, and, and just kind of you know slow the game down a little bit. And... And basically dare the Ravens. Like, if you guys want to keep running, we're happy to run too. Like, we're so mm -hmm. I, I don't know if that necessarily plays out, but that's the path I would see for Joe Burrow failing. Otherwise, I, I think it's wheels up for him. Got it. That makes sense. Pat, any any thoughts on this Bengals defense for I'm oh, sorry, the, the uh, Broncos. God, I can't talk. We'll edit this out. Don't the worry. Ravens any defense? thoughts on the Ravens defense for Joe Burrow? Yeah, I, I'm I'm pretty excited about the Bengals passing game here. Uh, the Ravens allowing explosive pass plays at the highest rate in the league. Um, Chase Brown 
or sorry, Chase, Jamar Chase. Now you got me <laughs> saying all of <laughs> Jamar, Jamar Chase uh, is in 99th percentile in double coverage rate, seeing double coverage on 48% of his routes. Um, but yet he's still been efficient, 2.10 yards per route run. Uh, T. Higgins coming back, I think, will be helpful for just kind of spreading out some of that coverage and the potential for big plays. And just his talent level makes Jamar Chase really interesting here. But then I think T. Higgins is also in a pretty interesting spot. The Ravens have not de- defended the splash zone very well at all. Um, Higgins has not been utilized in that part of the field this year so much, but small sample, and he was peppered in the splash zone last season. So if we're looking at who's going to benefit in the deep middle of the field, Chase, obviously a great candidate, but T. Higgins could, could kind of feast on those targets this week. So I actually think Higgins is a pretty awesome play. Um, as well as Chase. Uh, Gesicki had just a 4% target share last week, and he was still just kind of running half the route. So to me, I think kind of like it's – I would expect this to kind of consolidate again to Jamar Chase and T. Higgins. Yoshibas has been very competent as a slot receiver, getting out there doing his thing, but 0.89 yards per route run. Like I think he's mostly kind of helping fill a real-life role, but he's not – very interesting for fantasy. So yeah, pretty simple for me. I, I like the spot for Burrow and I like it to go through the top two weapons. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. No one's uh, ever been wrong and calling for a big game for T Higgins. So I'm sure that will come to well, fruition there. I don't know that I've tried it yet. I've seen every, <laughs> every, uh, everyone I respect in the industry is, is dead on the side of this road. <laughs> but I was like, I think I'll give it a try. Yeah, and yeah. I'll, I'll go ahead and call this as a T Higgins. T Higgins spike week. I'm going to do it. Yeah, I'm no. give it a shot. Yeah, surely he won't tweak his hamstring in pregame what warm-ups go wrong? <laughs> and never play a snap. That definitely won't happen. Um, <laughs> let's move on here to Bills at Texans. I think this is the most exciting game to me uh, from kind of a real-life football perspective in the 1 o'clock window. A lot of narratives here. We got the Stephon Diggs revenge game. Uh, we'll start here on the Texans side of the ball. Question for you, Zach. Do you – I think Nico Collins – Pretty clearly, uh, fantasy, you know, alpha wide receiver one for the Texans. We can talk on that later. But how are you sorting out the Stephon Diggs versus Tank Dell situation for the wide receiver two here? It looks like Tank Dell is going to be good to go. Yeah, uh, Dell was limited in practice yesterday from what I saw. He, he played, but he just had limited reps. Um, so I think he should be fine to suit up. I think both of the secondary receivers behind Nico are, are viable um, in all formats this week. Uh, I, I just, I kind of feel like people are a little early in dismissing and writing off tank Dell and saying like, ah, yeah, he hasn't done anything. It's, you know, he's played three games this season. He hasn't had a big game yet. It's over. And yeah, he's huge, guy, huge, huge bust too small. Too, yeah, too slow. We, terrible. Last year yeah. we saw this guy deliver huge explosive games, and and the way that it happened typically was it, him and Nico were trading off, right? And, and yeah, I think Nico's the favorite to to put up the most points for this receiving core here. But would I be surprised if Tank at the end of the day, Tank Dell is the one that ended up leading in fantasy points? He had a really big play, broke something, you know takes a route across the middle and houses a slant or something like that wouldn't surprise me in the least. And I, I mean, the, the bills are are also a little banged up in the middle of the field too. So it's kind of, now I know that uh, Nico is, is a splash on merchant and and definitely could, you know, feast in that area of the field as well. But, you know, I think, I think we're writing the obituary for tank Dell a little early. I've just heard people saying like, Oh yeah, he's the, he's very clearly the three behind the other two. And, I just don't think we can be that confident um, with the small number of games we've had and, and him missing a game due to injury. So if he's going to go under the radar, I think it's a pretty good spot for him. Um, I also really, I mean, how fun is the Diggs revenge narrative? You know, like you yeah. can't not, like, uh, with a guy that's as emotional as Steph Diggs too. Like you, you kind of know that yeah, he's a guy who like definitely wants revenge. You know, like <laughs> yeah. these are weird. <laughs> <laughs> these revenge games you gotta think about like the mo- how motivated is the player like extremely how many extremely how many motivated. 
<laughs> how many entries into his diary has he written this week about how badly he wants to torch the Bills <laughs> over under one and a half? I love the idea of Stefan Diggs, who strikes me as a as a you know an active personality, sitting down with a diary and just putting his thoughts on paper. <laughs> so, you know, it's his daily journaling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Honestly, if I knew if he was if he started journaling, I'm out. <laughs> I don't want that. I want, that. <laughs> I yeah, want his he's emotions going out of him on the field. Yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, don't, I do. Don't fully, I like, please. Yeah. I do fully buy like the revenge narrative stuff. Like, obviously, it depends on how much it's pressed into ownership. And I'm, I'm far from expert of that there. But yeah, these teams try their best to like, like the Packers last week, or sorry, the Vikings last week versus the Packers. Like, they were. Aaron Jones's role saw a huge uptick, I think, purely because they're trying to get him a touchdown against the Packers. Like, I think that stuff matters to the coaches. So I do expect, like, a little bit more schemed end zone usage for Stevon Diggs. Like, some some stuff that's going to help him get home here versus the Bills. Um, next question I had for you, Pat, back to Nico Collins. Like, I can't think of a wide receiver I'd prefer in fantasy rest of season but i've heard other people talk about oh you should sell nico collins high where do you stand on that like is he just the wide receiver one rest of season or how would you rank him overall there i don't think he is i think it's jefferson for me still um you're looking at collins right now with like the kind of distance between him and the other guys that you want to see if you're making a case that he's the wide receiver one going forward. But, you know, to Sack's point, we're only a few games in for Tank Dell. We're potentially, you know, a, a day or two away from a couple days away from uh, a Stefan Diggs blow up revenge game. You know, there are, I think, more reasons to think that by the end of the season, this could be more spread out than it is right now than with Jefferson. We just have this long sample of since he stepped foot on an NFL field as being arguably the best wide receiver in the league on an offense that's clicking like the Sam Darnold experience is going great. You know, that could obviously get worse, but I think it gets worse in a way where Jefferson is still getting there. So to me, I, I, I feel more confident in who Jefferson is. Um, I'm, I, I think that offense is going to be good enough to support him. And I think that like, Jordan Addison is not going to be eating into his targets in a way. I, I could see a big Tank Dell game, a big Stephon Diggs game, where like the offense flows through those guys. Now, most of the time, it's going to be Collins. This isn't to take anything away from Collins, who I'd probably have like I think number two. But yeah, um, Jefferson is still still the guy for me. That makes sense. Yeah, same same tier for me. I give a very slight edge to Nico, but. I think we actually have CD number two in the rest of the season ranks. And, and I, I still think I prefer CD, but that's one where you get, uh, we have Nico in the same tier. And I, and I think that probably yeah. is a real, real debate. Yeah. For me, for me, it's just a little bit of the, the grown ass man model, uh, factoring in with Nico Collins, just too big, too fast. Um, anyways, let's move on to the Buffalo side of the ball. It looks like Khalil Shakir has a chance to miss this game. I don't think we know that for sure, but that would be my guess right now is that Khalil Shakir misses. So question for you, Pat, uh, assuming assuming that's true, let's hold that assumption for a second. Who do you think the biggest beneficiary is in the, the receiving game here? Is it Curtis Samuel, Keon Coleman, Dalton Kincaid, spread out between all of them? How are you kind of viewing the absence of Shakir in this offense? I want to play the Bills through Kincaid. Um, he had the last couple of weeks, his route participation has been bad. Um, he had just 59% route participation, uh, against the Ravens. Um, he, you know, they also had the game, uh, a couple weeks ago where he missed some time in that game. But if you look at weeks one and two, he was at 83% route participation and 75%. I really would not be surprised if this is a competitive game. He doesn't, you know, there's like he was getting checked for a concussion a couple weeks ago and missed missed some snaps. Yeah. If he's fully healthy, the game's competitive. You know, they got just got blown out. So I'm kind of discounting the most recent round participation. Um, you look at him compared to Dawson Knox, 
22% targets per route run for Kincaid, 8% for Knox. 1.69 yards per route run for Kincaid, 0.6 for Knox. This is just a huge gap. And now, you know, they're losing one of the, their playmakers who is good over the middle of the field um, and good on some of these more intermediate routes. That's what we are looking for from Dalton Kincaid as well. They have very similar A dots, 5.3 for Shakir, 6.2 for Kincaid. And I was already most interested in Kincaid. Um, just given that I think maybe it's a little under the radar that the role is probably better than it seems like it is um, because of the last couple weeks being weird. Uh, with Shakir out, all of a sudden, I think Kincaid becomes a really strong play. Uh, this is this is a kind of a, a 2024 like emergence game potential for him. Yeah, that's that makes sense to me. And yeah, it's, it's tough to really have a lot of faith in the other guys. I do think... Um, you know, Curtis Samuel, Keon Coleman. I'm really interested to see in what those guys' roles look like this week. I do not have nearly enough confidence to go out and play them. Keon Coleman is truly being used as an outside X wide receiver. He has, I think, just three slot snaps on the entire season. Like MVS has more than that. Mac Hollins has more than that. James Cook, a running back, has more slot snaps than Keon Coleman. So, yeah, for, for him, I'll, I'll make a little bit of like an upside case for long term in the season. Like if they use this as an opportunity to get Keon Coleman some slot snaps and he can win in sort of the yards after the catch game, just on, you know, slants, uh, curls, like sort of intermediate short area stuff and use his yak ability that he showed in college. I think that's interesting for his long term profile. Not something I'm betting on this week happening. They're just not there's no evidence that they're they're trusting him in that role at all so far um I, question for you sec on the running side of the ball here for the bills is there anything to be gleaned from james cook's down game in week four and anything in this texans matchup that you think looks interesting for james cook i mean i think his down game was really just a function of the bills getting their their shit pushed in for lack of a better word so I'm not. I'm not super concerned. I love that you stopped. So I'll think of something, and then no, I was trying. Good. I was trying to think of anything better than that. Uh -huh. but I felt like that was really the only description that could do that game justice. That was not a fun game to watch. Like it was just no, it was not. But but I think that really what the Bills would prefer to do. I think that the Bills want to be getting the ball to James Cook if at all possible. And so I think Kincaid is definitely a really good option for them to try and, and do the pass game through him. But I also think it's a sneaky boost to Cook, who they will use in the pass game. I think he's going to be involved there. Um, so I'm I'm pretty interested in James Cook this week, even though the Texans, you know, they, they have a decent run defense and a, a good, you know, defensive line. I I think it's still a good spot for James Cook just because the bills are limited in their weapons. And I, I think that they've told, they've told us so far this season, they feel limited in their weapons. Like there's a reason that it's a pretty heavily rotational thing with all of their pass catchers. They don't have any guy. They're like, this is absolutely the guy we can't take him off the field. Like, so I'm, uh, except for I'm, Matt Collins. They, they are, uh, they think he's, he's guy. Matt Collins is a great win sprinter. I was, I was almost buying into the Matt Collins stuff after the first couple weeks, but they really don't throw him the ball. They do love – he's fantastic on-field cheerleader, though. Like, one of the best in the business. So, If they let him play barefoot, he'd be the wide receiver one. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Could you imagine? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Also, Bills, I, I love to pay uh, Curtis Samuel $30 million guaranteed and never use him. That's personally what I would have Seems spent good. my money on this offseason. Yeah. Part, um, part of it's got to be the turf toe stuff, though, right? Like, yeah, that's I a, yeah, I think it is. That injury can – I mean, we need, we need an all overpaid team. We get Deshaun Watson, a quarterback, DeAndre Swift in the backfield, <laughs> Curtis Samuel in slot. <laughs> It'd be good. Yeah. Jer Jerry Judy. Uh, can, Miles, can play. Miles Sanders, too, for sure, on that team. <laughs> Miles Sanders, yeah, yeah that's, he's the backup. Yeah. yeah. God, <laughs> Curtis Samuel. Um, let's move on here. I think that'll, that'll cover the Bills and Texans. Uh, last game we have in the show notes is the Panthers at the Bears. We got to talk about the Bears every week for for some reason. Um, 
Caleb continues to struggle even against a pretty weak Rams defense. To be clear, Sam puts these together. Sam is the one who picks these games. I don't no, know. no one's forcing it's me to co- talk It's about coming that. from corporate, man. My hands are tied. They, they tell me I got to. <laughs> Weirdly, 90% of our viewers are in Chicago. We have a huge uh, Chicago <laughs> fan base and leg up. I, yeah, I don't know. It's a, it's a corporate thing. It's not my decision. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, yeah, yeah. So, I'll talk uh, to corporate. <laughs> yeah, talk to corporate. Caleb Williams, um, Pat, I did think you had some interesting notes on Caleb Williams this week. You, you pointed out some reasons for optimism for him. Um, I kind of thought like, oh, Caleb Williams, uh, dog shit again versus the Rams. But there are underlying signs of improvement. Is that is that true? Yeah, his success rate was actually pretty decent last week. Um, his like if, if he was performing like he was last week, he would really jump out as a positive regression candidate. You know, if you're seeing like consistent success, but you're not getting really strong efficiency. Generally, you know, these things are correlated and and that's, you know, over the years you'd be like, oh, this guy is actually looking like someone we could see some positive regression for. But we only have one game of that for Williams. <laughs> Most of the, the season, he actually hasn't been all that consistent. Although over the course of the full season, he still is has been less efficient than you would expect given his success rate. Um, and so kind of a less exciting positive regression candidate over the course of the season. But, but Williams isn't really like when I look at like positive regression candidates, it's more of like guys who I feel confident in what they are. Right. And it's like, okay, they've kind of running bad, but with Williams, we're just trying to figure out like how good is he and how much is he improving week to week? And if you, if you chart out his EPA per play, his success rate week by week, it's just been a steady improvement. He started with a, with a ninth percentile, um, EPA per 10 percentile EPA per play, uh, and success rate in week one, uh, went to the around 15th percentile in week two, around 50th percentile in week three. And then he was up in the 78th percentile success rate last week, 56th in EPA per play. So we're seeing steady improvement from Williams. And then you look at his profile because, you know, okay, we're going to expect this guy maybe to, to hit a spike week, but does he have the type of profile to do that? Because Bo Nix had a nice game in week three, but it's because he didn't take any sacks and he didn't throw any interceptions. That's like good for an NFL team, but maybe not going to be super exciting for us. But you look at Caleb Williams' profile, he's throwing deep on 16% of his passes, which is pretty good. He's got an 8.4 ADOT, which is fairly deep, but he's got a 4.3 average depth of completion, which is 4.1 4.1 yards of difference between those two numbers. That that kind of points to a really inefficient downfield passing attack. And I went back and looked at who led the league each season in this metric, as Caleb Williams is currently doing. It was Will Levis last year, Marcus Mariota in 2022, Mike Glennon in 2021, and Joe Flacco with the Jets in 2020. That's like kind of a bunch of chuckers, right? A bunch of guys who, the prairie yards, the prairie yard kings. Um, but if you go back to 2019, we're looking at Aaron Rodgers, the season before he went on to win back-to-back MVPs, and then Josh Allen as a rookie. So I think it does point to kind of two paths here, which is one, Williams is just going to be a prairie yards guy at the NFL level, in which case he's going to be a bust. Or we're looking at a dude who hasn't yet connected downfield, but is actively trying to do so and is improving every week and is eventually going to turn into a pretty fun fantasy quarterback, which is what I think is going to happen. And you get the Panthers defense yeah. this week. who are 30th in dropback success rate against and 27th in EPA allowed per dropback. They're not getting pressure very quickly. They're 30th in time to pressure. Uh, they are 26th in PFF's coverage grades. They're the worst team in the league at protecting the splash zone. This very much could be the spot where we get a true breakout game from Caleb Williams, and I want to be betting on that this week. Yeah. My only problem with Caleb Williams is, like, I almost want to tout this as, like, oh, you should stack up Bears, Panthers, and DFS. Like, it's pretty interesting. The problem is the Bears' defense, I think, is just too good, and the Panthers' offense is not good enough to force them to to chase. I do think Caleb could have, like, a sneaky, efficient game here. Panthers' defense is terrible, but, yeah. I, I'm questioning the volume ceiling, I guess, but, yeah. That's clear. Yeah. Yeah. Not derogatory. Uh, yeah, but according to establish uh, the run ownership, he's projected to come in at really low ownership, low single-digit ownership. So, um, yeah, 
I, I don't know. I don't know anything about DFS. So yeah, play play Caleb Williams, I guess. Um, <laughs> well, predicting uh, the targets is the is the question. I mean, Zach, do you have any reads on on how? Because I that's the problem. It's, you're stacking him like with who? Yeah, um, is is really the question. Yeah, in in DFS, that's a lot harder. I would say if you're wanting to play Caleb Williams in DFS, the best approach is probably a little little mix and match, or maybe maybe Cole Komet just to fill your tight end slot. Yeah. Cole Komet. Yeah. Um, yeah. But in uh, in the battle royale format, the answer is pretty easy with who you stack Caleb with, and it's Keenan Allen because he goes undrafted like mm. almost all the time. So the guy who <laughs> Well, there's made, a reason for that. <laughs> if, you, if you made me a wager of who leads the Bears in targets this week, Keenan Allen is the favorite right now. Like, I don't think that's controversial. Like, uh, that seems like a pretty reasonable bet to make. Maybe you could say he and DJ Moore are even odds to, to lead. But, like, okay, so DJ Moore goes in the third round of drafts and Keenan Allen goes undrafted. I'm talking about in the dog bowl where 72 players get drafted. So, Keenan Allen going after guys like Jordan Whittington, Tutu Atwell. Uh, people are taking Cortland Sutton over Keenan Allen in some drafts. You know, like there's a lot of like Tyrone Tracy just went before him in a draft that I did. Wow. Like, so all I'm saying is Keenan Allen is not priced anything close to appropriately. So it like doesn't matter if you think he's bad or whatever. It's like, yeah, the projection needs to be wrong by like eight points on Keenan Allen for, for him to to go where he's going. Eight's a little a little uh, over exaggerated. It's like five, but yeah, as long as the projection is not off by five points on where Keenan Allen's median outcome is, then he's an incredible play uh, in in the dog bowl specifically right now. Yeah, and I mean another way to play this, I think even like with Caleb, and I hate it, but DeAndre Swift. DeAndre Swift had 63% of snaps last week after falling to 54%. We got the Roshan Johnsons coming for the job type of reports, but I, th I think it's fair to say he defended his job last week. He was actually pretty good. Uh, 16 rushes, 93 yards at a touchdown, seven catches, 72 yards on seven targets. Um, I, I, I don't necessarily want to bet on this to hold and Swift to be, you know, the guy who's the clear RB one the rest of the year, but he is right now, um, and if he gets volume in a matchup where Caleb Williams actually emerges as the guy we were hoping he would be, then, you know, with a receiving role, and it's not consistent explosiveness, but he does have explosiveness from time to time. You know, you could you could see Swift getting there too. So, yeah, I, I like the Keenan call in, in dog bowl type stuff. I also think he's viable in DFS. Um, Komet certainly is, but... Um, yeah, I think we could go DeAndre Swift here too. Yeah, um, I'm a Keenan Allen hater, but I'll I'll reserve uh, those takes for the ship chasing Discord. You can find plenty of those takes in there. Uh, we'll move on here to the Panthers, starting with you, Pat uh, Xavier Leggett. Pretty exciting breakout game last week. Went six for sixty six and a touchdown. Also got a couple carries. Uh, I think two carries for twelve yards in that game. How excited are you about Xavier Leggett going forward? Is he kind of immediately in the wide receiver three mix, given how well Andy Dalton is playing uh, and given Adam Thielen is on IR with a hamstring injury? Yeah, my my assumption would was that he and Jonathan Mingo would split the available work, um, the available routes last week with Thielen out because they both have played a decent amount in the slot. Um, and that is what happened. So that was nice to see. Um, and then Xavier Leggett just way ahead in targets per or, or first three targets uh, per route, 17% to 10% uh, Leggett versus Mingo there. Uh, but this is not a good matchup. Um, no. that, that would be my, con that would be concern. Number one, concern number two is that it's designed to go through Deontay Johnson. Deontay Johnson has a 27% first three target rate. Guys with 100 plus routes this year, only Malik Neighbors is higher than that. Um, and I was looking into Johnson's efficiency. He's been very efficient with Dalton under center. He's got 2.77 yards per route run with Dalton. Uh, he has a totally fine yards per target. He's always kind of has a bad yards per target, Deontay Johnson, but he posted a 2.8 yards per target, which is just <laughs> atrocious with Bryce Young, 7.9 with Dalton. It's been fine. 
the offense is designed to go through him. So, yeah, I mean, I think Leggett is the point where, like, you could definitely use him as kind of a fill-in, but I'm not that excited about him this week. I'm more um, kind of excited to have him on my bench and, and hoping that the role continues to grow. Yeah, that makes sense. I think, yeah, great guy to stash this week. Maybe if he has a down game, you can send out some trade offers. Um, I do think his start to his rookie year, again, it's really, really small sample, so don't put a ton of weight into this, but 1.5 yards per route run, close to 20% targets per route run. Those are kind of like 70th, 75th percentile marks for a rookie in terms of um, those per route metrics. It kind of puts him in the same ballpark as rookie seasons from guys like Jordan Addison, Deontay Johnson, Brandon Cooks, Sammy Watkins, as sort of some upside comps. And then obviously there's, there's tons of busts in that range as well, but it's a, it's a good start to his rookie season. And I'm just really excited. Like when a team, an injury goes down with Adam Thielen and immediately they're like, okay, is able to get is our number two. We're giving him two end rounds in this game. We're getting the ball in his hands, seeing what he can do after the catch. Like it's, it's exciting to me that he was clearly a featured part of the game plan. And I do think that could even grow later in the season, but yeah, this week versus the bears, uh, not the time I'm too excited about playing him. Curious what you think, Zach, given how tough the Bears defense is, is there any angle here? Is there a way to play it through Chuba? Do we just rely on the target volume and go with Deontay Johnson here? Or is this Panthers team like a, a stay away in weekly contests this week? I think people tend to overrate like the defensive matchup stuff. And so they just get really scared when you're going against a good defense. And the roles for Chuba and Deontay have been so, so incredible. So to me, it's just like, the especially like in underdog right now, you're getting a large discount. Like Chuba has an ADP of 25.6. Deontay has an ADP of 24.7. That doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> like if you're if you're looking at guys going before them, you're getting Josh Jacobs going before Chuba Hubbard. And Josh Jacobs is is getting like half of the touches on on his own team as far as carries are concerned. It's getting the passing game work, but they, they look to be in a spot where they'll probably be playing from ahead. Um, you know, you've got guys like Devonna Chan and Chuba Hubbard go back to back by ADP. What are we doing? You know, like I, I love Devonna Chan, but the, the Dolphins just really have not been able to get anything going at all on offense without Tua. And so for Chuba to be discounted that heavily, I think people are just double, triple, quadruple counting the matchup stuff here. Um, and and I, I find that happens a lot on Underdog where people aren't using an optimizer. So they're not taking a, a projection on something and saying, all right, well, this is what I expect is a reasonable outcome for the guy. And, and here's the range around that. And then I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and optimize and use my linear optimizer and figure out what the best lineup is that I can play. People are getting the rankings. And then after that, because they're having to make the selections in drafts, they're doing the human brain thing of like, but this is a bad matchup here. So I better like move this guy down a little bit. It's like, no, 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 that's already been factored in. Like the matchup is, is in the projection. Like don't you, your little head doesn't need to do that. It's not going to be good at doing that, but people do it regardless. And so like Deontay Johnson is sitting right ahead of Amari Cooper. And while I like the matchup for Amari Cooper, number one, it's on the road. And Amari Cooper has famously never been <laughs> on the road. Um, and, and number two, he has a terrible quarterback throwing to him. Like guy, guys that are right here with Deontay Johnson, you're like choosing between Brian Thomas or Deontay Johnson. And I love Brian Thomas. He's in a great spot. But like the targets that you can project for Deontay Johnson versus the targets you can project for Brian Thomas are like, you know, leagues away so i i just think that you're getting too large of a discount on these top two panthers weapons and so it's just a spot that i think in draft style formats is definitely attackable that makes sense to me and i think yeah the other benefit is again we've seen with this bears offense they're not blowing anybody away on the offensive side of the ball so even if their defense is really good i think the panthers definitely in a, in a huge range of outcomes here can keep this game close and don't have to completely go away from running the ball. So yeah, I think, I think that all makes sense there. Pat, any, any final notes on the Hubbard conversation? No, I would just agree. I mean, I think we we see this um, every year, some offenses just condense and we get like 
you know, maybe like the right, the Rams would be an example, right? You get like Puka and Kyron and like you, they're both going to get there in a lot of games and they're just, we can just count on that volume. Even if the matchup isn't there, we can count on the offense to run through a couple pieces and the Panthers are starting to look like one of those offenses with Dalton under center now. Um, and I, I agree with Zach. I mean, I think Deontay Johnson is, is a wide receiver one and honestly, you know, Chuba Hubbard's kind of a, a low end running back one with, with kind of, you know, the, the rest of the, of the, the, yeah. uh, the running back options this week. So yeah, I think you do want to factor in the matchup to an extent, but um, after you do that, I still think these guys come out as really strong plays. And, and on yep. this slate particularly, just we've, it's the first bye week that we've got, right? Like we, we've got some of the running backs that typically would have been, you know, that are occupying the, the top running back slots on a slate. They're either on an island game or on bye. Like, let me let me read you some running backs here and you tell me which ones you would say confidently, confidently are, are better than Chuba this week. So I think the first three, like, Jordan Mason, Derrick Henry, Kyron Williams, those ones I feel pretty strong about. Like, yeah, I want all those guys over Chupa, right? Then yeah, we get to yeah. this next tier. And it's like Kenneth Walker, okay, coming off a huge game, playing against the putrid Giants with no Malik neighbors. They'll probably oh, be yeah. ahead. I, I like Kenneth Walker over Chuba. But then we I get into like more than Henry, to be honest. But yeah. 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 Then, then we get into James Cook, Josh Jacobs, Travis Etienne, Brian Robinson. Any of those guys like screaming way ahead of Huba, Chuba for you? I would I think I strongly take prefer Jacobs. Chuba. I, I oh. think. Why are we talking about ETN? <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, yeah. That's 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 gonna say ETN and Robinson has this like knee injury he's dealing with game time yeah. decision. So he did. Um, he did. Uh, he did practice, so it's looking more positive for Robinson. Um, but yeah, he he's. Could be a game time decision, is what I'm saying. But Eckler's probably back. Eckler's back, so, yeah. I think yeah. Eckler is yeah. back, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I agree with no, that. No, yeah, it's definitely. a great point. Yeah, yeah. You you are Jacobs over him, though? I'm not Jacobs. Uh, I mean, no, I was I, asking I, Sam. Oh, okay. yeah. I mean, come, come on. It's the it's the Packers versus uh, the Panthers going against the Bears. It's, it's definitely Josh Jacobs for me, but... I get, I get the conversation. Um, I, I definitely think he's in the same tier or better than Etienne and Robinson. So overall, I agree with Sex point. Yeah. Um, okay, bonus game here, and then we'll wrap up. Actually, just bonus team. We don't, we don't have time for both sides of the ball here, but Sack did want to get some Colts takes in. It looks like Colts versus Jags this week. It looks like Joe Flacco is going to be the quarterback uh, for the Colts. Not confirmed, but Richardson looks limited in practice. Flacco is taking majority of the first team reps as for now and it, Zach, yeah go ahead. to be clear sack did not want to get cults takes in sack has cults takes we <laughs> asked him to put them on the record yeah i, I foolishly him. was talking about cults takes before the show started <laughs> and now i'm i'm being i'm having this information extracted from yeah. me like I'm a he hostage. was weirdly yeah, yeah. Exactly. He was weirdly high on Trey Sermon. I think he said Trey Sermon RB this week in in the pre-show meeting. Yeah. So, really, so explain that one sec. I thought it was a pretty bizarre take, but why is Trey Sermon the RB this week? <laughs> I, I definitely didn't say that about Trey Sermon. Um, but what I what I did say, I, I now I don't think Trey Sermon is bad. I, I think that uh, well, actually, I, I think Trey oh, he's Sermon is an NFL running back is bad. But as a play this week for his cost, he's probably not bad. Um, sure. But man, if you get Flacco playing here, and these these two teams are two of the faster paced teams in the league, they both are very porous pass defenses. Um, and, and we we just saw what Flacco did with, you know, I, I don't know that the Browns last year had far superior weapons than what the Colts have this year. And we saw Flacco going absolutely nuclear. Like, I, I think it was like, Flacco was odds on favorite to throw over 300 yards each game that he played for the Browns last year down the stretch, right? Like he just, he couldn't stop throwing for 300 yards. And so you get this incredible spot. I think people were already excited to play Brian Thomas this week. I think Christian Kirk is a good play. Evan Ingram might be back as well. He could be a good play. And so you get this side. It looks like the Jags, you know, if the Colts defense can remain as bad as they have been, the Jags seem like they could probably do their part to keep the Colts playing fast and throwing the ball. And so then if you have Joe Flacco back there, 
you're going to add a bunch of pass attempts because you're not losing all the pass attempts to the Anthony Richardson rush attempts, right? The passing is going to be more efficient than Richardson because Richardson is really, it's pretty binary with Richardson. It's like, did I just throw a long touchdown? If yes, fantastic. If no, like none of the receivers are getting there, right? So and it if really yes, makes... it's only to Alec Pierce for some reason. <laughs> long touchdown, yeah. And also it's, oh, uh, but I just threw an interception. <laughs> yes, yeah, which isn't bad for fantasy. Not not bad. Um, it honestly isn't, yeah. Might might keep them passing more. But anyway, Joe Flacco is also happy to throw interceptions too. So I, I think this is a pretty sneaky spot. So the problem with the Joe Flacco stuff is if you're doing it on like salary cap DFS, like DraftKings or FanDuel, by the time it rolls around to Sunday morning, we're going to know who's starting for the Colts. And so you're not going to be able to get one over on the field by playing Joe Flacco if he ends up being the one that's starting. Um, but in draft formats where the majority of the contests are going to be full by the time that you get to having the information of, hey, Joe Flacco is the starting quarterback, the field can't catch up enough to punish you for playing Joe Flacco. So Right, if you if you play Joe Flacco in the dog bowl right now, for example, let's let's look at how full this thing is. It's it's about forty percent full currently, and so if you're playing Joe Flacco, and he ends up like say we knew Joe Flacco is the starting quarterback right now, I think he would project to be one of the top twelve quarterbacks that you would draft. So he would be someone that should be close to one hundred percent drafted in this format, and so then you're looking at, okay, well, 40% of the contest is full. So the most that Flacco could possibly be drafted is 60% of 8%. So, you know, you're looking at give or take 5% is the maximum he could be drafted. And he probably won't because people are slow to adjust to this stuff. So you're going to get Flacco pretty significantly under owned. And then I think that's a major boost to the Colts' weapons, too. And, and Josh Downs goes entirely undrafted. And that's I what I was going to ask about. Because Downs, to me, is the guy that really, really benefits here from Flacco. He's got the shallow ADOT. He's been peppered with targets. He's good, but he's not really a great fit for Richardson. And so if he's going undrafted, you can swap from Richardson to Flacco. And you're, to your point, like not a ton of people will do that, but like they could do that. You can't swap to Downs. So here's, here's the problem. The Richardson swap, I think, is more dangerous than people realize because I don't know that he'll be inactive. I don't know wow. that he's going to be inactive. I, I think it could be very possible that he is healthy enough to be suited up and active for the game, but he might be the backup for this week while they say, we, we want your hip to get right. Like uh -huh. we, we need you to be able to use your physicality. And, and right now, like we wouldn't feel good about that. We need to protect you from yourself. Now, granted, they don't want to have him inactive and then say Flacco gets injured and they're rolling out like who is their third emergency quarterback there? Like that's probably not good. So Sam Ellinger still around? There, oh uh, God. Let's see. Yeah. Man, yeah. I sold so Sam you, Ellinger what you're saying, in the Superflex <laughs> Dynasty, and I, I could not feel any better yeah. about that. I remember <laughs> some cool like, Sam Ellinger preseason stats. He was like really good at dealing with pressure in the preseason. I was like, this dude. And then like immediately I like watched him in an actual game. I was like, oh no. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was right what I sold him. Predicted. The year that he, he uh, Matt Ryan got benched for San Ellinger. I think that's when he first came into our lives. I think I blew yeah. like 40% of my fab in a super flex league uh, with oh, all yeah. my buddies. And never have I gotten bullied so hard uh, when he got benched immediately the next week. because I blew 100% so, so and then traded him immediately. <laughs> Wow, <laughs> nice draft work. pick out of it. <laughs> nice yeah, work, dude. Smart. Um, well, anyways, yeah. The the uh, Sam, how, what, you know, what pick did you send for for Elder to, to sack there? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I traded Jamar Chase for him. I thought I, the rookie season. Oh stuff. yeah. I, I just think he, well. he couldn't catch the ball like all the drops in the preseason. Yeah. So yeah. I was. And it's super flex. Yeah. yeah it's super flex. <laughs> yeah. Um, but anyways, this uh, this. I, I think what I heard Zach saying is this Anthony Richardson hip injury is sounding suspiciously like Russell Wilson's calf injury and that it's oh. going to it's gonna get more and more painful the better Joe Flacco looks uh, next week. So just keep, we'll, keep your tinfoil <laughs> hats on for that scenario. Um, Let I, me ask I don't, this. I don't know that I'm all the way there yet. <laughs> no, I'm not all the way there either, but it's going to be funny if Flacco dominates. It's going to yeah. be a little funny. I mean, so so the angle for me in DFS and maybe in I, I, you know you're in the streets um, and I'm not really for for these draft games, but um, although maybe I will be this week. But um, 
the Jaguars side is actually kind of interesting if we think Flacco's going to go on the other side, right? Because it's potentially the game. It's just like a more – now, Richardson could obviously push the Jaguars if it clicks, but there's like a lot of scenarios where like they just fizzle. And the Colts completely fizzling, those – that potential, you know, is reduced when Flacco's on the field. It kind of tightens up the range of outcomes for the Colts offense in a way that's probably helpful if you're betting on this game to be a good one. Um, Trevor Lawrence, I think, is already in a really interesting spot here. I think Brian Thomas is a really interesting play this week. I considered making him the cover boy this week uh, in a matchup where I think we could see Trevor Lawrence in a same, similar way where I was talking about like Caleb Williams, you know, potentially like he's trying to make stuff happen and isn't isn't happening. But like I want that if I'm betting on on a guy to kind of spike uh, after disappointing, you know, I, I don't want him to have to like if you look at the Sean Watson's profile. He's doing like he's doing nothing cool. It's just all awful. Like, I'm not like maybe he could out of nowhere be good again, but like he's not even really trying to do stuff that we like where Trevor Lawrence is throwing deep and, you know, has a really deep a dot. And so you could see in a good matchup, it start to click. And if you play it from the Jags side, you know, bringing back a downs or bringing back, making sure to bring back a Pittman or a Sermon and trying to bet on this game to be like a shootout type game. Is that going to be underowned in in these draft formats? Like even, and that's also a little less dangerous if you do get Richardson, where you know you've got the Lawrence stuff and a bring back with a Colt. If it is Richardson, you're not you're not dead. Where you know I, I feel like you know a Flacco <laughs> a Flacco uh, Josh Down stack would be not very fun if Richardson plays. Yeah, that's it's definitely higher risk to play it through Flacco. Um, so I, I do like having it through the Jags. I mean, really, I think the best way to do it because Flacco's undrafted and Downs is undrafted is you're intentionally pushing quarterback every time that mm-hmm. you're doing this. And so you're really trying to get like these the elite tight ends on the slate, the best running backs on the slate. And then in the third round, you can typically get one of Brian Thomas or Michael Pittman or Christian Kirk, one of the receivers from this game. And then you throw your fourth round is just whatever other receiver you're putting in there. Or running back and then your last two picks are quarterback josh downs yep i like it. i like that all right guys um that'll do it for this week's show uh, like i mentioned in the beginning check out legendary upside check out the walkthrough lots of great stuff going on there pat anything else besides the walkthrough you want to tell people about uh yeah walkthrough uh as i mentioned the packers write up is above the paywall the uh london game also above the paywall so go over to legendaryupside.com check out the walkthrough um it's only 10 bucks a month to sign up so uh yeah if you're if you like what you're reading you get the walkthrough you get our weekly rankings you get a rest of season rankings you get best ball content from sack you get uh stephanie miller's waiver wire article you get matt irby's quick slant right up of the primetime game so uh, have all the games covered for you with um, breakdowns of the matchup, who we like to score, uh, you know, at the skill position players, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, legendaryupside.com. Check it out. Awesome. Um, I think that'll do it. We'll be back next week. See you guys. I'll also mention uh, I narrate the walkthrough. So uh, shoot me a note on Discord or you can email me at legendaryupside at gmail.com if you haven't been able to set that up as a subscriber, but uh, if you enjoy consuming your written content and audio format, uh, premium subscribers get a, uh, a private podcast feed with the the audio of the walkthrough, a uh, little perk. So yeah, we got that for you too. We'll see you next week. Thanks so much for watching. Uh, we'll be back here to preview week six.